you will avoid the common mistakes job seekers make, and you will understand the overall rules of the world of work and job seeking. Okay, let's get started. If you're at the right place at the right time, getting a job can almost be effortless. Most of the time, however, those that get job offers have positioned themselves to be the person to hire. They have successfully followed a process of executing step-by-step -step those activities that incrementally increase their odds of getting a job offer. Therefore, it's important to put into perspective some absolutes when it comes to the world of work and therefore the job-seeking process. Two absolutes when it comes to people in general, you and me and everybody else on the planet. When we examine why people do, do things and don't do things, it's helpful to know about the two radio stations everyone listens to. We all listen to WIIFM, What's In It For Me? And we all listen to WDTM-FM, What Does This Mean For Me? Nowhere is this more true than the world of work. And without being cynical, We'll just take into account how these two dynamics impact why and how people do things. Just always keep in mind that people usually do what is in their best interests more often than not. Let's next establish some absolutes in the world of work and jobs. And as you review them, keep in mind everyone's two radio stations and see how they come into play. There are seven of these absolutes. The first one. Every organization and every manager, from the CEO to the newest supervisor, wants three things. High output, low cost, no problems. Therefore, to make the cut, you need to demonstrate that you have historically been a high output person or offer that potential, and that you're not a problem person. High output people arrive early, do the work on time and error-free, and do more than is expected or asked of their job description. They also fit the low cost mode. They don't abuse the lunch hour, breaks, expense accounts, sick vacation leave policy. Job leverage means that you bring to the table that great attitude, strong skill sets, solid experience, and that you can be counted on to get it done. Your references need to reflect that you're a team player and get along well with people. You're a no-problem person, an employee. Football great T.O. or Terrell Owens, despite his great football skills, was traded several times because he was a problem to his teammates, his coaches, and his owners. What does this mean for you? Focus your job searching efforts where your experience and skills can generate job leverage. Recognize the value of being viewed as a high output, high output, a no problem employee, and always be working toward that objective. Number two, the rules of supply and demand prevail. The principle of supply and demand truly illustrates a major dynamic of the job market. The cycle repeats itself in many an industry. A housing boom means a high demand for mortgage loan processors. The initial supply of them is low with a high demand, and that means big incomes as a result. But only initially, because people flock to become one, and pretty soon the supply matches the demand, and mortgage companies can hire for less. Then there's a bust in the housing market, and no need for as many mortgage loan processors resulting in many who are then let go. We now have a low demand, high supply move. When considering a career path, job search or career change, factor in the supply and demand dynamic. There's many sources of data available as to which jobs, industries, and careers are on the upward trend and which ones are headed south. What does this mean for you? Do your research about trends for various career paths of interest you want to be in the mainstream. Number three. You're in competition for every job you seek. And competition for jobs means comparison. Comparison of capability and cost. If you're a whiz-bang staff accountant with a base salary of $60,000, you're in competition for that accounting manager slot with other staff accountants, some of which may have a base salary of $55,000. If you can't justify that extra five k guess what? You may well lose out to the fifty-five k person. Here's where job leverage comes into play to justify paying your higher base salary. Any employer that needs to fill a position has a certain supply of candidates from which to choose. The candidate that's offered the job is, in the opinion of the employer, the best combination of will do the best job, is the best fit personality-wise and will fit within, within the employer's culture without problems, and is the most affordable. What does this mean for you? Are you, in fact, competitive for the jobs you are interviewing for and seeking? 
If not, can you be? Or do you need to readjust your plan? Number four, every job is potentially at risk due to innovation, automation, and changes in the marketplace. Remember our absolute number one? Every organization and every supervisor every day is thinking of ways to increase output, lower costs, and minimize or eliminate problems. Innovation, outsourcing is a perfect example. Outsourcing work to a firm that specializes in one narrow niche, such as outsourcing payroll to a firm like ADP, means no more internal payroll department jobs and no more administrative HR work to be done regarding that function. Outsourcing also means no employee people issues. The people who do the work are ADP's employees. Automation, with the same work done with fewer people through the use of computers, the internet, and other automated systems. Changes in the marketplace. More and more people are reading fewer newspapers and magazines, getting their news and other information on the internet. This has led to a significant reduction of newspaper and magazine advertising, which means far, far fewer ad salespeople, as well as the jobs creating those ads. The drop in revenue from selling advertising has in turn been translated to staff cuts to lower costs, hence fewer jobs on the writing and editorial staffs of newspapers and magazines. Bottom line, changes in the marketplace have made print journalism not worker or career friendly. Remember Blockbuster? Gone, gone, gone. Changes in the marketplace via innovation. If there's a way for a staff of six to become a staff of four and still get it done, it will and should happen. What does this mean for you? What's the future of the industries you are interested in interviewing with and exploring? Make sure it's not a dying or declining industry. Number five, if you're a supervisor, your first loyalty is up, not down. I once had a general manager of a branch office who over time more and more became an advocate for her staff. Let me repeat that. She became an advocate for her staff. Wanted more perks for them, wanted to accommodate the request for more of this and more of that. And guess what? When she did, they wanted more. Yet productivity did not increase. Sales did not increase. There was no quid pro quo. Nothing in return for all of her efforts, except she was very popular with them. Her need to be liked surpassed her understanding of what her job was. She forgot her first loyalty was to the mission of the organization, to achieve maximum profitability, and therefore operationally to her boss, me. Your job as a supervisor is to maximize the productivity of your people, holding them accountable for results. Take care of them, of course, and make sure they have the tools and environment to be successful. Train them well. Listen to their concerns and issues, but not at the cost of productivity and profitability. This can be a particular challenge for a newly named supervisor, especially if your subordinates were your peers yesterday. Just remember, your first wall is up the organization chart, not down. What's in it for you? You simply can't succeed. In the long run, you to recognize that your loyalty and focus has to be the organization's mission. Number six, job security resides in skill sets. Are you or were you the go-to person in your department? If not, why not? If not, then your skill sets are not the best in the department and your job is potentially at risk. If you are and you lose your job through no fault of your own, you'll find a new job faster than someone who does not have the same level and degree of skill sets. And there's two universes of skill sets. Hard skills, which are software skills, technical job knowledge, memory of past problems and issues in the resolution, application of basic business principles, strong writing skills, the ability to make strong oral presentations and good negotiating skills. Soft skills are problem-solving skills, the ability to find solutions, the application of common sense, a sense of curiosity that leads to figuring things out, a sense of logic and priority setting, good manners, etiquette, charm, and great people skills. Your soft skills are reflective of your mindset, your sense of self-esteem and self value Great soft skills are often characterized as having your act together. Your continuing education is your responsibility, no one else's. Some employers will offer access to training and education. Maybe even pay for college, graduate school, or taking advancement courses. But keep in mind it is you that is impacted the most by a lack of strong skill sets. Take advantage of the resources of your industry, trade association publications, published trends, technology issues, access to all of it. Can be almost all of it can be found online. If you aren't a reader of books that will help you grow, you're shortchanging yourself. Sure.
sure, read the Western novels and whodunit you love at the beach. But don't overlook the successes, the stories of the great successes and failures of others. They can be found in biographies, autobiographies, and the stories of history. There is also no end to the timeless business books published in the past, and new ones are hitting the shelves every day. What does this mean for you? I maintain that a study of the successes and failures of others is the equivalent of an MBA in management. So if you travel to the past, with George Washington, Robert E. Lee, and Dwight Eisenhower, to name just three, you can learn from their mistakes and emulate what made them successful. And to say nothing of having a wealth of great wealth of anecdotal information at your fingertips. Number seven, finally. More people are fired, hired, promoted, or not promoted based upon interpersonal communications and conflict resolution skills than any other single reason. How are yours? Do you pass the Tulsa test? The Tulsa test is a total stranger who would enjoy sitting next to you on a long-distance flight to Tulsa and furthermore would tell their friends about their delightful seat to come. Do you naturally get along with people? Are you the person people want to sit next to at a social or business occasion? Or the one nobody wants to sit next to. We all know obnoxious people who are the last ones we want to sit next to or even talk with. Even talk with. Are you sometimes rude or brusque with people? Are you able to argue your cause without antagonizing people? You display lots of obvious what's in it for me. In fact, much of the key to this lies in eliminating from yourself those things that drive other people crazy versus being charismatic yourself. There really is nothing more critical to success as the ability to get along with people, inspiring trust, confidence, and loyalty. Let me repeat that. There's really nothing more critical to success as the ability to get along with people and inspire trust, confidence, and loyalty. And this applies at all levels. One only needs to see the reason given for a Fortune 500 CEO's dismissal as management style to know what this really means is the CEO couldn't get along with the people he or she needed to work with. What's in it for you? Keep in mind there's a difference between confidence and arrogance, and assertiveness versus aggressiveness, and that one of the objectives is just to be a likable person. Let's do a quick review. Seven absolutes of the world of work and jobs. Your boss will want high output, low cost, and no problems, and ideally for you to be a go-to person. The rules of supply and demand prevail. You're in competition for every job you will seek. Every job is at risk. Innovation, automation, changes in the marketplace. Well, it's an organization and your boss. Number six, job security resides in skill sets. The interpersonal communication skills must be wrong, but must be strong to achieve success. Okay, let's move on to resumes. Your resume, the key to your job, better get it right. The purpose of the resume is to get an interview. The purpose of the cover letter is to get someone to read your resume. Both need to avoid the rejection that a bad resume or cover letter will trigger. If you sent your resume to your Uncle Fred, president of the family business, no matter how bad it was, you'd still be invited to come in for an interview. Family ties count. Most of the time, however, your resume is read by a series of strangers. These readers briefly scan a resume for a few seconds to a minute to see which of three piles it goes into. Yes, no, or maybe. Those in the yes pile are the only ones studied to see if they meet enough of the job criteria to merit further consideration. Only if there aren't any yes resumes are the maybe resumes reviewed in any detail. Therefore, your resume is truly the key that begins to open the door. I have probably seen tens of thousands of resumes over the past 40 years, and indeed, some of them have been real doozies. Many have been riddled with typos, have been a copy of a copy of a copy that got on the copy machine crooked, have a coffee cup circle stain on them, have been unreadable for a variety of grammatical and syntax errors. I've seen resumes that don't have full contact information between them. How did that get by the same? In addition to how resumes are screened this way, now resumes are being screened by scanners more and more. Scanners doing keyword searches. What that means is your resume must have those keywords on it. And we'll talk about that in more detail in a few minutes. Avoid, however, of submitting your resume via a portal if at all possible. If you're applying online and it says submit your resume here, chances are it's headed to a scanner. If there's no way around that, go ahead and do that. 
but then find a way to get a resume emailed and or mailed snail mail to the ultimate decider for that position. Do your research, find out who the department head is of the engineering department, or who the HR person is that processes his engineering resumes, whatever the case may be, and find a way to get your resume in front of them. Don't rely upon a scanner at all possible. Let's add some perspective to how you should not prepare your resume. To have your resume effectively eliminate you from ever getting that telephone call or email to discuss your credentials, follow these time-tested rules. I've seen every one of them over the years, so these are very much for real. Number one, tell her all. Go back 15 years or more to include every job in great detail. So what if it goes on for four or five pages? It's all important stuff, right? Wrong. The resumes that make it to the yes pile are reader-friendly, concise, and easy to read. They're focused. They allow the reader to quickly grasp current capabilities. They cut to the chase. They tell what the candidate has most recently accomplished. I know this is all for alumni, but for students, skip the summer life jobs, lifeguard jobs, unless that's all you have. That really doesn't help a great deal applying for a real job in the real world. Number two. Use as many pages as you need. Wrong. Recruiters do not want to plow through a three or four or five page resume. Even with 20 plus years of varied experience, two pages is enough to tell your story. Remember, the purpose of the resume is to tell the reader why you should be interviewed. It is not a biography or a life story. Number three, write it with no objective critique by others. After all, who knows you better than you? Wrong. You have very little objectivity when it comes to your own resume. Have someone else, and preferably several other people, read and critique your resume. Ask them to specifically look for the who cares, so what, that creep into resumes. For example, a statement that you were active in the boys club in your hometown 10 years ago. So what? That has nothing to do with your ability to do the controller job you are seeking. Number four, list activities instead of results and accomplishments. By now, you've figured out the answer is wrong. The reader is looking to see what you've accomplished and the results you brought to previous positions. Terms such as responsible for and coordinated can't stand alone without measurable results. Your resume needs to tell what happened because you were there. Far too many resumes are full of activity statements. Better to have two statements of achievement of results than ten activity statements. Number five, use creativity. Colored paper, colored ink, a photo, fancy eye-catching graphics, fonts, that sort of thing. Wrong. This is not a graphics competition. Remember, reader-friendly. Besides, colored paper and colored ink does not photocopy well. Include a photo? Why? Even if you look like a movie star, your picture will increase your odds of receiving that phone call or email for an initial interview. Fancy presentations. If your resume leads to an interview, the employer will want to make photocopies to distribute internally. The resume needs to be photocopied. For now, if you're interviewing for a creative position, have a portfolio of your work and bring that to the interview. Six, start with an objective statement listing the things you want in your next job. Wrong. With all due respect, initially, who cares what you want? The resume reader is only interested in whether you are or are not qualified for the position he or she is trying to fill. The time for your interests and objectives to serve this is during interviews and when it comes time to make a accept the offer or decline the offer decision. You should, however, begin your resume with a summary of experience and accomplishment statement. Be careful to keep it objective. Be sure it includes factual results and accomplishments, not superlatives. Here's an example. Two examples. Twelve years of accounting experience, including five years of public accounting. Account management responsibly for several SEC reporting clients, supervised audit teams, specialize in trade association accounting activities and software, including unique tax and foundation issues, featured speaker at trade association CFO seminars. A second one, 17 years of progressive experience in management, maintenance, and training related to local and wide area networks, both PC and mainframes, and applications associated with them. Extensive experience in the configuration and maintenance of Cisco routers and switches. Extensive experience troubleshooting software and hardware problems and creating procedures and systems to avoid recurrence. Extensive experience in creating and managing large and complex databases. 
Both of those are great opening statements because they tell the reader what this person's broad capabilities and experience is, and it paves the way then for them to go down and look at the specifics of the job they're at. Don't include a cover letter. <clears throat> Wrong. A cover letter, one page max, is a must, and its objective is to tell the recipient why they should read your resume. It's the overall picture of who you are and why you're submitting your resume. A cover letter personalizes your resume. It should be tailored to the organization to which it's being sent and specifically for the position you wish to interview for. If responding to an ad or job posting, have your cover letter mirror the language in the ad or posting. I estimate that over half the resumes, resumes I've reviewed over the years have not included a cover letter. Not having a cover letter forces the reader to start reading without knowing generally what they're about to read. The letter should be business-like. Don't start it with good morning or anything clever or cute like that. It needs a proper business greeting. Avoid overkill. Don't include phrases such as, are you looking for a superstar? Or, I'm a one-of-a-kind, take-charge person. Let your accomplishments and what you've done speak for you. Your cover letter for an envelope should be on paper stock that matches your resume. We're trying to be professional. There's many sources for matching paper and envelopes. Just be sure it's white and of a good quality and not copy machine paper. Email resumes have a unique cover letter challenge. Unlike normal mail, where the cover letter is the top sheet and hence the first to be read, how do you do this with an email resume? Simple. Make the cover letter the text of your email and then also submit it as an MS Word attachment. End the cover letter email with, I've attached my resume and also a copy of this cover letter. Now, why would you attach the cover letter file? Because it facilitates being printed to be shared internally without having to print the email itself. Here's an example. Dear Mr. Harris, I am writing in regard to your published position for senior auditor on your website. As can be seen on my enclosed resume, I have significant accounting and audit experience with ever-increasing responsibilities. I am particularly proud of leading my audit team to consistently completing our work ahead of target dates. I've also been part of several successful client development efforts, and I have found that to be both very rewarding and fun. One of my career goals has been to work for firms such as yours, and I'm confident I can make a significant contribution from day one. I'm available for an interview immediately, and will call you in several days to see if it's possible to arrange a time for a personal interview. Thank you for your attention. Sincerely. That's a great sample cover letter. Take that as a format. Use the same resume and cover letter every time you submit your resume? Wrong. Each position you apply for is as unique as are the organizations you seek to work for. Most of the customizing is in the cover letter, but you also revise the resume to match the circumstances. For example, let's assume you're a degreed accountant with significant experience as an account manager and controller. Your, job, your resume for a job as <clears throat> VP of finance will stress your management experience while your resume for a job as a controller will stretch your hands-on experience generating financial statements. Really important here, as we talked before about the scanning process, if you're responding to a specific position, every resume and cover letter needs to mirror the job listing. Not just for the scanner, but you want the words to jump off the page and say, holy smokes, this resume, this cover letter matches my job listing. This is a match. Make sure the job title, the primary responsibilities are word for word, included in your resume and cover letter. Choose the most important keywords in the position listing and make sure those identical words are featured in your resume, including the lead-in summary of experience and accomplishments. Same for the cover letter. Without those key words, your resume may not even make the preliminary cut. Write your resume in the third person. Mr. Jones achieved. Wrong. You don't talk that way. Why would you write that way? This Jones increased output and productivity by 40% versus I achieved a 40% increase in productivity. You don't talk that way, of course you don't, then don't write that way. It's, it just, it's annoying and it smacks of an attitude. Finally, number 10, include personal information such as hobbies, names and number of children, marital status, social organizations, affiliations, etc. Wrong. This information is not necessary takes up space, and it's just that much more detail the reader has to read and digest that is not directly connected to your ability to do the job. 
Okay, that's a list of the most 10 common resume errors. You would think most people would, through common sense, avoid these 10 errors or some of them, but I have seen each of them over the years many times. And so, a word to the wise, pay attention to those common errors. The other resume guidelines, however, don't include the references or the statement references upon request. It just takes up space, and generally the organization is not going to rely upon who you list as references. They'll want to talk to former bosses and possibly co-workers, and they'll ask for that contact information at an appropriate time. Don't print resumes and cover letters on copy paper. Use 24-pound bright white paper. Learn to look professional and business-like. And as we said, don't ever submit a resume that's a copy of a copy. Every resume you mail should be an original printed one. You're customly customizing each of them to some degree to include, include keywords and not mass producing them. Format. There's essentially two different resume formats, chronological and functional. Look at these examples. The one on the left is a chronological resume. The one on the right is a functional one. In a chronological resume, each position is listed in sequence, starting with the most current position and working backward. It's easy to understand the person's career path. You don't need complete sentences, bullet phrases are fine, but just tell the story. A chronological resume like this is the preferred format. Avoid the functional format that details functions performed, skill sets, areas of work responsibility, but does not do so by employer or date. It's confusing and makes it difficult to follow a career path. Use of graphics should be limited to bold, bullets, underlining, and dense. You don't need full sentences. Bullet points are just fine. Amount of detail. The amount of space uh, devoted to each position is weighted. So the more recent position has more space to put it than previous positions. A good rule of thumb is to detail the last three jobs or go back 10 years, whichever is greater. Information about positions before 10 years ago or three positions back should just be listed with no details provided. Just list an employer, job title, and city state of position. Content. Write your resume to answer the following questions. What do you do for a living? What have you accomplished? Did you do anything exemplary? What specific experience do you have? Chaired a committee? Were you responsible for installing a new computer system? What happened successfully because you were in the job? Detail this information briefly. If your job title is confusing or could be misleading, be sure to clarify. For new grads, you're not expected to have an extensive resume, but again, go back to what happened because you were there. Now, I know this is, you're all alumni out there. Um, if, if you're not a senior yet, if you know people who are still in school, tell them that to skip the summer jobs as lifeguards, cutting grass, or things like that, and get some internships. Internships are great on resumes, provide access and experience in the real world, and they truly help enhance a resume of a relatively new grad that they did something of a meaningful nature uh, in an organization. Always use month and year for dates, not just a year. And if there's a gap, be prepared to explain it. Finally, be truthful at all times about all things. Your resume is 100% under your control, so no excuses ever for a less than truthful resume. There's two major ways for a resume to not be truthful. Both are guaranteed to put you, at the very least, in the worst possible light. In many cases, one or the other will result in your immediately being eliminated from consideration or even terminated if you've been hired. It comes in two flavors. The first is errors of omission, hiding gaps in work history or otherwise not revealing information that a prospective employer wants and needs to know. Then there are errors of commission, a.k.a. lying, claiming a non-existent degree, a job title you never had, or accomplishments that weren't yours. Resume fraud. Think of George O'Leary and Ronnie Pew. George who? Ronnie who? George O'Leary's dream job was to be Notre Dame's head football coach. And he was, for five days, 2001. He claimed to have a master's degree and had played college football for three years. But neither was true. Bye-bye, Jordan. This was him at the news conference when it was announced that he was no longer the head coach at Notre Dame. I think you can see he's not a happy guy. 
Ronnie Few was Washington, D.C.'s fire chief, beginning in 2000 for 22 months, until it was discovered that he lied about his professional and educational credentials in his resume. Bye-bye, Ronnie. These two examples point out something recruiters have known since the resume was invented. A significant percentage of resumes are fraudulent. Don't let yours be one of them. Chances are the resume you have today, regardless of any updates over the years to come, will still be out there for someone to stumble over and compare to the most recent. They had best be in sync. <clears throat> you don't need to pay to have your resume written if you follow these guidelines. If you were thinking of having your resume written, I just saved you a couple hundred dollars. Okay. You now know how to write a killer resume and cover letter. So let's move on to interviews. Interviewing, the bridge between you and your next job. The purpose of the interview process is to find out all there is to know about you and determine if you're the best person to hire from the pool of candidates being considered. Can you do the work, perform it at a high level, and bring value to the organization? Are you a good fit for the culture of the organization and the people for whom you will be working? Your job interviews will consist of two lines of questioning. First, fact-finding question to explore and determine your hard skills talked about hard skills before. Factual information, the what, when, how much, and for whom kind of information, such as, do you have the required education and special training called for by the physician to fulfill? Same for any required cert certifications. How does your work experience correlate to the job in question? How long will it take to get you up and running? How diversified is your pertinent work experience? Does your experience consist of a variety of tasks, responsibilities, and experiences or have you done essentially the same activities over and over again? The difference is 10 years of varied experience versus one year of experience times 10. The difference is, what is your depth of experience? How knowledgeable are you regarding your general field? For example, if you're in the accounting profession, are you knowledgeable about GAAP, financial reporting standards, knowledge of the tax code, etc.? How strong are your computer and software skills that correlate to the job or general field of employment? How are your verbal skills, your persuasive skills? How about your writing skills? Has experience shown that you're a skilled writer? The second line of question are behavioral questions to explore and determine your soft, soft skills, seeking to understand what kind of a person you are and what makes you tell. Questions will begin with, give me an example of, or tell me about a situation in which, or let me paint a picture and get your take on how you would address it. The interviewer, wants to learn such things as how well do you get along with people? How have you handled interpersonal conflicts? Do you have a sense of humor? How do you think of yourself? How have you resolved problems big and small? How have you responded to deadlines? What leadership tendencies, if any, have you exhibited in the past? And what are your interests outside of work? Excuse me, I'll take a Marco Rubio sip of water here. The mission of the interviewer is to ask both fact-finding as well as behavioral questions and then determine if you are a possible match for his or her organization and the job in question. Your interviewer will want to anticipate to the greatest extent possible what the organization will know for sure after you've been on the job for 90 days. Typically, you'll have multiple interviews with an organization before getting a job offer. In many cases, there will be more than one person. So expect multiple interviews with multiple interviews. Your mission is to make the cut every time. This is a single elimination process. Some of this is determined through references and background checks, and perhaps testing. But much of it will come from a verbal back and forth of in-person interviews. Again, before an offer can be extended, the interviewer and the organization needs to anticipate what they will know for sure after you've been on the job for a few months. You want to make sure that three things happen as a result of the verbal back and forth of these interviews. One, you answer all questions fully to the satisfaction of the interviewer, and in do so, paint the most favorable but honest portrait of yourself. Two, you fill in the gaps in the interviewer's battery of questions to make sure all the favorable, positive aspects of you and your employment are fully recovered. And three, you don't raise red flags. Don't give the interviewer a reason to screw you out. There are four distinct components of interviewing successfully. 
one, preparation. Anticipating every question that will be asked and preparing the questions you will ask. Number two, getting your mental game together. Number three, your opening approach. You only get one chance for a first impression. How to begin the interview and get it right. And number four, wrapping it up. How to close out the interview and follow up. We're going to explore each in detail. Preparation. You should never answer a question in an interview for the first time. You need to be prepared to answer any and every possible question you might be asked by an interviewer. You also need to be prepared to ask questions to flesh out full knowledge of both the job as well as the organization. If you're going to do anything a multiple number of times, it makes great sense to figure out the very best way to do it and then cookbook the process. Interviewing falls in this category. As we said, you're going to be interviewed a multiple number of times, often by different people at the same organization. You really need to nail the answers every time. And the only way to do that is to draft in writing what you want to say as an answer. And speak it aloud and revise the answer to fit the spoken word. Ideally, have a friend or relative ask the questions. You speak out loud the answers in return and have them critique your answers. You can read the answers for this exercise and then again edit the written responses. Time-consuming? Yes. Is it worth it? Absolutely. The point is you should never wing it answering a question. Your response needs to be natural, an extension of your thought process. Yet you want to put the absolute correct spin on it to convey the thoughts, ideas, and image that puts you in the best possible light. And if you prepare properly, you should virtually never have to answer a question for the first time in an interview. You've answered it before in rehearsal and hone your answer to be the best possible answer. Have you essentially memorized the meat of each answer? Yep, you sure have. To not do so is to risk not doing your best. Actors commit to memory their lines because they understand that without sticking 100% to the script, the storyline will not be as clear and vivid as the producer and writers intend. Your interviews are no different. It really isn't that hard. The process of modifying your answer and rehearsing them will result in you remembering them Perhaps there's talking points, but you'll remember them. As you draft your answers, take a tip from everyone who's ever been trained to get media interviews. Use the question as a platform to both answer the question as well as make a statement. That means your prepared answers need to include a positive comment about yourself in light of the answer. For example, you are an accountant, uh, you're an accounting manager, and you're interviewing for a controller's position or some such thing, and the question asked of you is, Tell me how your accounts payable department functioned. They're trying to find out if you're a good manager of people, what the process is. Your answer is, we have a staff of two people using the Sage Peachtree system that works like a charm. That's the answer. Here's the statement. We had three people doing it with an antiquated software system when I arrived. I persuaded our VP of finance to let me install better software because I knew it would be easier to generate the reports we need as well as being able to eliminate one person. You answered the question, and then you added a statement to it that talked about your capability to solve problems and get things done. You also need to write and rehearse an opening statement, which you'll find a way to inject into the first few minutes of every interview. It should take no more than two minutes to recite it. Start with, I appreciate the opportunity to meet with you and discuss how my background and achievements might be a good fit for the position of controller here at XYZ Company. Continue with a dialogue that paints the picture of who you are, what you've accomplished, and why you're looking for a job at this time. And then conclude with, I'm easily adaptable to change and eager to make a real contribution where I end up. Does that sort of paint the picture for you? In addition to preparing answers to all anticipated questions, you're going to draft several questions that you'll ask when the interviewer invites you to do so. These can be in your notes and you can read them the time comes. And your questions really have two objectives. One, to find out all you need to know about the job, the organization, your, your perspective boss. You need to have that complete picture so when the time comes to accept and reject an offer, you really understand the structure. And secondly, to further sell yourself to the end. Part of being prepared is not to raise any red flags. Organizations hire defensively. A bad hire can become a real problem. It's not the hiring process that give HR managers HR VPs and CEOs, the heebie-jeebies. It's the unhiring process. We live in a litigious society, and lawsuits for unjust terminations are a real mess. I'm looking at a recent survey 
about employment lawsuits for unjust terminations. And the, the criteria was if, if your case has just one plaintiff and no horrible facts that would make a jury cringe, expect to pay up to $50,000. That covers about a third of all employment law cases, a third. If you have one plaintiff and horrible facts, you're likely to pay between $50,000 and $100,000, 28% of all cases. Is it no wonder that organizations hire defensively? They're looking for the problems that will cause real problems. They're looking for the red flags that will cause real problems down the road. So you want to avoid the red flags. Perhaps one of the most common is just a crummy attitude. You've got to be positive, friendly, warm, genial. You want to be seen as logical, adaptable. No matter why you're looking for a job, or how much you hated your last job or hated your boss, this is not the time to bring it up. You want to be seen as a positive force, not a negative force. Second red flag, lack of focus in the interview. No daydreaming, listen to the question, no wandering around the verbal landscape. Uh, focus, focus, focus. Answer the question specifically with the correct personal spin on it. I suggest to people when they prepare those answers, they almost have a 50-cent version and a dollar version. The 50-cent version answers the question correctly with the right spin on it. But if the interviewer wants to know more information, they say, well, tell me more. And then you add in another factor to you to further flesh out your answer. Red flag, not being on time. It shows disrespect to the interviewer and the process. It throws everybody off schedule. Number four, I guess it is. Not having researched the organization and their industry, you'll be asked a question or two, like, what do you know about X, Y, Z? What do you know about public accounting here in Milwaukee? Or whatever it may be, you would best have an answer. Rambling on and on and on. Balance the talking with listening. A pet peeve of interviewers are people that talk on and on and on. The analogy is ask them what time it is, they'll tell you how to build a clock. Red flag, not making eye contact. Warm eye contact with a gentle smile while you talk and listen bonds you to the interviewer. Darker tinted glasses and the cell phone earpiece. Lose them, period. They have no place in an interview situation. And then, if you have an ear ring in your ear, get rid of it for the interview. Casual attire. This is a business meeting, which means men should wear suits, ties, long sleeve shirts, women, pantsuit or business skirt and blouse. This is not a picnic. Inappropriate attire. Skirts that are too short, inappropriate necklines, uh, logo neckties, too much perfume, aftershave. Again, this is a business meeting treated that way. Inarticulate. You need to pronounce and enunciate, not be a mumbler. Remember, nice to meet you is not the same as it was nice to meet you. You need to be sure you are not a mumbler. Ask people who know you well, are you articulate? If not, you really need to work on that. Listen to the folks doing the 6 o'clock news. They are articulate. There's no uh and no well. It's all smooth. You need to work upon that. If English is not your first language, practice, practice, practice. There are a lot of people that they're here in the country for a year or two and their English is very good. There's people that are here in the country for 10 years and their English is not very good. It's a matter of focus. Number two, getting your mental game together. You've got to be 100% on top of your game with no distractions. You want to bring your A game to an interview. Now, you've already prepared the interview. You've rehearsed your opening statement, had a good night's sleep, and you're dressed for success. What next? You know where you need to be. You made a dry run if, that's, if necessary in doubt, and remember that you're on time. And five minutes early is on time. Um, many a time, nothing will throw you off worse than being late because you're lost, because you can't find it. And a phone call saying, I'm running late, I'm lost, this simply tells the interview you didn't prepare because the address hasn't changed. The better your behavior is needed. No ear tugging, hair arranging, pocket change jingling, keep your hands in your lap. Again, it's disconcerting to an interviewer or a recruiter to sit and watch someone constantly rearrange neckties, hair, do those kinds of things. Focus. Keep your hands in your lap. So have extra copies of your resume in a nice portfolio and have a nice pen at hand. I say nice portfolio and nice pen. Don't show up with a soiled vanilla folder or some kind of plastic briefcase with the plumbing supply company's name on it. For $15, $20 at Staples or Home Depot, you can get a nice portfolio that has a zipper on it. It closes. Two things from falling out. It's professional looking. that you would take to a meeting. And you have a, a nice pen that writes well 
and does not have advertising on it. Again, it's the impression you're trying to make. You have your calendar with you for the next few weeks. So that when an interviewer says, we'd like you to come back next Thursday, you could say, yes, I can do that, as opposed to, I don't know, I've got to check my calendar and call you back. Watch your language. There is um, no place for profanity in a job interview, not even a gentle damn. Watch your use of lingo and slang terms and never, ever begin a sentence with the word like. It just smacks of not being able to communicate. Remember, focus, focus, focus. Number three, making a great first impression. Smile at every one of the interviewer's location. Everyone you come in contact with is important. You never know who has whose ear. The security guard you pass may have been there for 25 years and knows the CEO on a first-name basis. Smile at everybody. To everyone, say good morning or good afternoon. Give them a greeting as you pass them walking to your final destination. State your purpose. I'm here to meet with Mr. Thomas Smith. My name, my name is Rob Alberta. Silence the cell phone. Have a firm handshake, not a bone crusher, nor something that's limp either. Both of them drive interviewers crazy. Have a nice, firm handshake, business-like handshake. Refer to the interview as Mr. or Ms. unless they specifically tell you otherwise. As soon as you're with the interviewer, state, I'm really looking forward to talking with you about this position at XYZ. I've done some research regarding XYZ, and I'm very impressed. Now, obviously, you better have an answer ready. If the interviewer says, well, really? Well, what impressed you about us? So have an answer ready. But you're trying to make an impression and impact that you earn. This was just not a job interview. You're interested in the firm itself. Sit up straight. Don't slouch. Have a notepad in your lap. Take notes. Maintain good eye contact and nod occasionally as the interviewer speaks. Wrapping up the interview, going for the close. As the interview winds down and or ends, make this statement. Mr. Johnson, I really enjoyed talking with you, and I must tell you I'm most interested in exploring becoming part of the XYZ team. Say this even if you don't think it's for you. Why? You want to see where it goes. It is not uncommon for the interviewer to sit across from you and say, you know, to themselves, you know, this person may fit better in another department here where we also have an opening or I know one's going to so the time to turn anything down is when you get a job off, not before. So play it out. See where it goes. Many a time, talent is recognized by a recruiter or interviewer, and it may not be for the position they originally applied for, but they end up going to work there anyway. Find the time also to ask Mr. Johnson, what's the next step in this process? When might I expect to hear from you? Firm handshake, big smile, and then leave. Send a follow-up email. Mr. Johnson, I really enjoyed talking with you, and I must tell you, I'm most interested in exploring becoming part of the XYZ team. Get your notes in order and move on. All right, you now have a much better feel for how the world of work operates as well as the overall job seeking process. You now have the ability to create a killer resume, and you now know how to shine in any interview situation. I've enjoyed spending time with you today. We're running almost late. We got started a little bit late. But for further information about the job seeking process, go to my website. Uh, it also features a book that I have written just released in March, The Ultimate Job Seeker's Guide. And much of what you heard today is a very small portion of what's contained in that. If you have any questions, uh, I don't think we have time for them today, uh, but email them to this email address. I will compile them with answers and I'll post them on the website. Again, from one Drexel alum to all the rest of you, uh, enjoy your day. Good luck. And thanks for being with me today.